So yeah, what I'll be talking about today is essentially a couple of projects and a new style of journalism that we've been developing at the Earth Journalism Network, which is essentially geojournalism. And the beginning of this project with Info Amazonia, which is kind of our flagship project. So I'll be getting into that in a second, but kind of to let you know a bit about who I am and what I do, I'm sure Internews and especially EJN may be a new thing for each of you. So essentially, I'm this project coordinator, and I work with a global network of environmental journalists. And we are a community of about 5,000 people uh, who are really all over the world. We're operational in 119 countries, if you think on an individual level. Um, there's about 5,000 people, and th this is the cities that people are living in, so not the individuals. And the way that we work is we're kind of a network of individuals, but we're also a network of networks. So these are some of the partner organizations that we've been working with over the last 10 years. And so we've either uh, helped to create new networks of journalists in countries where they don't exist, or working with net already existing networks in places where they do. So the ones that I'll be talking about specifically today are the SIEJ in Indonesia and OECO in Brazil. And this is kind of how we work. So we have three major uh, activity types, or basically strategies, tactics. And at the center of it is, is story production. We're all journalists, and we're trying to talk about these big global issues. And we all have our own local perspectives, our own local audience. So kind of the three overlapping issue areas for us is education. These kind of things are training, workshops, fellowship programs, network journalism. So if we have all these people and they're all over the world, how do you actually help them communicate with each other? How do you um, kind of leverage each, each other's knowledge so that you can put these big global issues into uh, a local context? And also, how do you build collaborative investigative teams who can look at things that, are, that go beyond a national scope, as so many environmental issues do? And so for us, Geojournalism is a way that we can facilitate exactly these ideas, building off of the more traditional education and networking activities that we've done. So with that said, um, geojournalism. So what is it? Essentially, we have maps. We've been talking a lot about data today. But we haven't been talking so much about stories. And this conference is being led by a media house. It's SciDevNet. And we are also somewhat of a media house, media organization, uh, more of a media development group. So we also care about how you contextualize that information. So these maps uh, are essentially providing evidence. They are that global context that's so difficult to understand. They're the things that are gathered from satellites or NGOs um, and can really kind of show you in a very quick way what is the state of the rainforest. You know, how much pollution is coming from that factory? These kind of very real, tan tangible things that you can learn from data. But without the context to understand why that's happening, who's doing it, it's really hard to make changes based upon that information. So we view stories as the way that you can kind of explain the data, contextualize the information that's being displayed. And when you put those things in combination, you have geojournalism. So, this in, what the maps that I mean, when I say maps, I'm talking about interactive maps. Although we do have static maps, but we really want people to explore data. So you look at you know, Google and the personalization of information. So these interactive maps are a way to break through that kind of filter bubble and explore issues in a more holistic way. The journalism, as I was saying, they, it provides this background to understand these large scale issues because ultimately, um, the issues are all bigger than one story. But you know, no issue can be ex <laughs> like you can't really understand these big issues without explanation. So there's this kind of uh, mutually reinforcing symbiosis with stories and data. And then the last bit of it, as journalists, is that organizations are often collecting data, but they're not always sharing it. So we can kind of be this ambassador so that we go to organizations and say, hey, we want to use it. And when we get it, we always make sure that whatever data we use, we can then open. We can share. 
So all of the things that I'm about to show you um, in these different platforms, it's all accessible. You can download all of it in many different formats, and that's what I'm really going to be explaining today. So Info Amazonia, this is where it all started. This was you know, the birth of something new. Uh, so in June 2012 at Rio Plus 20, Info Amazonia was born. And this is what it looked like. Essentially, what we have here, in terms of the information, is 30 years of deforestation. We have mining and protected areas and all kinds of extractive industries information, the oil plots, the, the oil wells, the pipelines, um, the forest fires. So forest fires, but also what's causing those fires? So cattle ranching, lumber processing, all of the drivers of deforestation that link all of these things together. And even alerts that will tell you on every, every 15 days what was cut down in the last few weeks. So if you're monitoring here, you can see about as good as you can get in terms of what's going on in the Amazon. And as I was saying, cattle ranching, showing some of these kind of tertiary issues, these supporting issues that contextualize not just you know, the story, but also the other data, because these, these issues are linked. So these are some of the, the map sections. We, we show all of the maps that we have. We, even, we customize maps for different audiences. So like, we take data from different groups. We can make custom things. We can um, sort things in different ways. We also show the stories. So here, basically, as you sort through the website, you can see from a variety of different publishers um, the stories on top of the maps that are linked to also media, like uh, multimedia. So here's an example of some of these partnerships. With the Amazon right now, there's 10 different media houses that we collaborate with. So this is kind of a, a common ground for different voices that are talking about the Amazon to share a space with this background of evidence. So at least everybody's kind of mutually agreeing, like, this is the state of things. This is the, the common ground. And now from this evidence base, you can have some informed discussion. So here's an example of a, a media partner, uh, Manga Bay. So when you click on one of those things, you see each of the different organizations like sorted. You can look at each story going back in time. You also can see RSS feeds. So like this is the first one. And with uh, Equatorial, which is what I'm about to be talking about, I'll show you some new things as well. So an important bit here is the ability to share in social media. So we also focus very clearly on how do you distribute information. It's not all about collection of information for us. Uh, it being media, it's about how do you get that information to people. So simply being able to share customized things in social media being able to integrate multimedia into um, so that people don't have to click out. Basically, within a couple of, of clicks, you can get right to interactive graphics within a context of location that's back, backed up by evidence. And then also, this is uh, something that was important in terms of distribution, is the ability to do customized uh, embedding. So like a, like a YouTube video can be taken out of YouTube and placed on any website. You can do that with these maps. Any of the layers of information that we have, if you want the stories, you can even, you know, with a simple interface, customize the size of the window. So that really we want to be able to distribute information even if a user won't know what to do with the data that we've assembled. And you just make it available for download. You can still use this information in a simple way that is pretty uh, standard. And so it, to, in, in basic, this is how it works. We aggregate data from a wide variety of people, whether it's government, NGO, academic. We source stories from a network of journalists and publications. And then more and more, we are also collecting information from citizens and journalists using a lot of the tools that have already been talked about today to verify and ground truth some of this information. And what Info Amazonia and what geojournalism is, is when all of these things are synthesized into one platform. So here's an example of, of how all of these things coming together can equal something greater than each of the individual parts. So what we're looking at here is deforestation or, and mining in the Peruvian Amazon. And this is a, a, you see this blue finger into the rainforest? I want you to remember that pattern for a second because that pattern will show up again in this video that was taken 
using some money from the Carnegie Institute and published on Manga Bay. So with one click in our website, you can find this story, you can see that map, and then you can see the video, which is showing you exactly what that blue streak represents. And that's this real mining, this degradation that only happened in three years. It took three years for this to happen, from this sea of green to this scar of just chalky mining. So that's the potential of something like equatorial or of, some, of geojournalism. And why I'm here with you today is to show you how this is spreading, both with our help and with simply open source tools, putting things out there in the open so that anyone can pick them up and use them. So this is equatorial. This is our Indonesian platform launched about two and a half weeks ago. It took six months to make, 18 people working on it on three different continents. And what we're looking at here is kind of the new version, a new template. And this has also been integrated back into Infamazonia. So this is how it was launched, and we're looking at fires in, in Indonesia. And what we've done is we've added some new features. We made it a bit simpler, uh, a bit more like single window approach so that you wouldn't have to scroll down if you don't want. It works well on tablets. Um, and we have some similar issues. So right now we're looking at the forest industry. This is in Borneo. We're looking at palm oil and concessions. And we're actively updating now with the deforestation information. Like Once this project's launched, we keep this data up to date. We keep adding to it. We keep finding more information. We keep publishing. We have that fire map that we were just looking at. So this is in Ryu province. I actually just saw on the CNN news, they were talking about weather this morning. They were using Google Earth. They could have used this if they wanted to. My, this is basically the last 10 years where, for, where fires have happened, and then where the most intense fires have also happened recently. And then also, we're, we're focused on ocean issues now. I mean, Indonesia is an island nation. It's 3,000 miles long, or I guess 5,000 kilometers. Um, but what we're looking at here is ocean traffic and marine protected areas. So we're using satellites and some private, private industry partners to be tracking large vessels. And we can do this also in real time. And in just a three month period, we got nine million records in, in Indonesian coastal waters of uh, vessel traffic. So what we're looking at here is how they're going through marine protected areas. I saw on SciDev there was an article about, you know, are marine protected areas actually real? Like, uh, you know, so there's this debate. You could use a map like this to say, well, yeah, actually people are you know, they don't mean anything. Like, we can see in the traffic from the satellite. Like, okay, yeah, they're going through all the time. And this is the kind of monitoring that when things like this are in the hands of journalists who have audience and can distribute it, this kind of monitoring makes a huge deal. Because just the simple fact of letting the world know that people are watching this and you can, you can know, even if it's imperfect, it makes people stand up and notice. And I think that's, that's, a critical, that's a critical point here when engaging Southern media partners who've traditionally operated in an information vacuum where they can control information. So now that you, you can say it's not so easy to control anymore, you can't hide from space, how are these people, how are the governments going to respond? How are NGOs going to respond? Are they going to share more now that it's harder to not? We also, just because, you know, environmental journalists, here's coral. I want to show you. The, the, coral, the coral map looks really nice, by the way. So does the ecology map. So this is mangroves and seagrass. And these are habitat areas. This is where fish come from. 60% um, of Indonesia's population depends on fish for their primary source of protein. 90% of these habitats are degraded. So this is a new feature that we've done for, for uh, Equatorial that we've also integrated back into Info Amazonia. So this is um, the Explore Our Stories feature. And what we have here is um, basically the start of a stories API. So let's say we, we publish on 10 different category areas, and we have a lot of keyword taggings. So in the editorial systems for these kind of things, we have a, a team in Jakarta who's tagging and translating and uh, geotagging all of these, these stories. So if you want to know about, say, palm oil, 
you can do a free search in the text search and you can get all of the stories on palm oil. <coughs> if you want to search for marine issues or just forest issues, the general categories, you can do that. Time, you can also do that. So why is that important? Why is that helpful? Well, let's see. What we have here on top of these advanced filters is a couple of very subtle buttons that say you can build RSS feeds off of these customized queries. So if you want to know about palm oil, you can then say, get the RSS feed. And you can hook that up into your email or into an associated website so that you can depend upon us and our network of journalists who are all throughout Indonesia or the Amazon or I'll explain more about the growth of these things. You can get that information from people who are on the ground closest to these changes in a way that you never have before. Also, there's this button called Get GeoJSON, and I know, you know we're not all technical people, so I'll just say what this button allows us to do is take everything that we've done, all of this geolocation tagging, all of these pictures, all, everything, and you can, if you want to have a map with stories on it, you can just take that button and put it exactly into your site. So the first group that we're thinking will do this is Global Forest Watch. So what they can do is say, I want categories, forest. Get GeoJSON, import into Global Forest Watch. And if you're not familiar with that, it launched last Friday. It's a global project focused on one issue, deforestation. And they're looking for stories to contextualize this huge issue, which has so much diversity. So how do they make it meaningful besides just presenting data? They can source stories from our networks in an easy way that technically fits with them. And then we can help get information from the smallest of, of publications. So like look here, there's Aceh Terkini. That's a small independent journalism group based in Aceh. So if you want stories from Aceh, shouldn't they be from people from Aceh? They probably know pretty better than you know, some, even a national media in the own, their own country. So we've focused on using this network of, of 400 journalists, environmental journalists throughout Indonesia and say, all right, well, we want stories from you. We're going to make it easy for us to collect those stories, tag them, put them in good formats that are easy to share, and then pump them up to audiences that are global. I mean, Global Forest Watch is mostly a policymaker, business, NGO, global, international platform. That's who it's talking to. But it can utilize some of these on the ground things, on the ground narratives in these kind of platforms. So this, this talk is about global geojournalism, the spread from Info Amazonia, which, you know, it's, I guess, less than two years, about 18 months ago, and now to Equatorial. And also, I'll show you two examples that are one's in South Africa, the other's in Kenya. And how is this happening? Well, it's with open source technology. It's not just about open data. It's about open code. It's about sharing what you know and making it easy for anybody to pick up and repurpose. So this is the JO template. It's WordPress. We picked WordPress because ultimately, it's easy for people to manage. People are familiar with it, 15% of the websites online are using WordPress. So we've <coughs> customized it to manage these kind of platforms. So there's just a couple of the um, custom content types, whatever. Um, so here's some examples of how other people are using it besides how we would traditionally and customizing it to their own needs. So here's the Oxpeckers website. So this is a group of investigative journalists in South Africa who are using the JO template to monitor rhino poaching and to take information that can show every instance of poaching and also arrest of poachers and make that into a story. Because it's easy to make every instance of that, it's, e it's difficult to make every instance of poaching a story. But if you also have these maps, you can show each and every one so that people know what the state of it is in a very detailed way. There's also um, LandQuest, which is in Kenya. And LandQuest is essentially uh, a project that's focused on aid and development. So I bet the, what is it, the aid data folks would probably get a kick out of it. 
So it's like all of the bore wells and oil wells that are happening in a couple of these provinces, uh, Turkana up in the north, and I'm blanking on the name of the uh, one in the south. But basically, how do you make you know, thousands and thousands of little wells, like little dots on a map, something that makes sense to people? And so there's some really interesting ways of getting people down to the information that they need. So I, I, I invite you to explore this, this site and kind of get a taste for the, the different information here. And it's also, I'd like to note that both of these adaptations are specifically focused on enhancing investigative journalism and providing that evidence that supports investigation. So lastly, um, I wanted to show like, okay, so we've got the websites, we have good examples. And I think it's important to note that Info Amazonia, the, the, like this kind of progenitor, um, a lot of people saw it, and it was sponsored by CDKN, or the people who initially put the money up. It took five years to raise the funding for it, and they made the initial investment. And once people kind of saw the concept, it really took on a life of its own. And I think that, that if there are takeaways for any kind of donors or people who are here now who have, I know that um, Nick asked that question at the very beginning of today. Like, what, if you were that kind of person, what you, should you take home tomorrow? Like, so that there's a lot of inspiration that funding a project like this can have that has, you know, that you, that's not part of an, a, a single project, but that can take on a life of its own. And that there's value in investing in these kind of innovative initiatives just to demonstrate what's possible. Because when things are possible, when you show what's possible, it can become acceptable. And that's ultimately, in my opinion, what development is. So that's technology, that's data, that's stories. But there's also a major knowledge gap. That's the, the real the challenge we were trying to address is we know that there's a ton of information out there. We know that people want to show this information in their work. We know that not everybody has the ability to do that, or the money, or the time. So with the first, we wanted to show, we wanted to, we want to say if you don't have the time, you can embed this map. You know, it's very easy, just take it, we've already done the work, just, you can pull it. If you don't have the money, we can provide open source tools and say, you know, we're not in that for this. It's just adapt it. Here it's free. It's open. And if you don't have the capacity, we have this geojournalism handbook. So with this network of, of 5,000 environmental journalists, we, we're lucky enough to know who our audience is. They're environmental journalists. They're working in developing countries. Most of them speak English as a second language. And most of them don't have a lot of time to think about this kind of stuff. So how do we create tutorials, methods of learning, that can answer problems that people are actually facing? <laughs> <laughs> so not necessarily, well, this is a tool. This is Ushahidi. This is Frontline SMS. Here's a manual. Why would you use it? So here we have Frontline SMS, and I know it's hard to read. Um, how would you use it for uh, like natural disaster communications? And this was a project that some partners of ours in the Philippines, and it's basically their system. And they're saying, this is how we used it. If you want to learn from it, this is exactly how we did it. Here's one that I did with some friends of mine at the public lab, which is a citizen science group. It's a balloon mapping, so how to make your own DIY satellite with a balloon and a camera. This actually gets a lot of traffic, even if people kind of have to wrap their mind around it. Basically, yeah. <laughs> um, it's pretty cool. This was something that was originally deployed during the Deepwater Horizon oil spill in 2011. And uh, BP, the oil company, had basically shut down uh, the airspace and weren't allowing anybody on boats. So what this group of like an NGO, um, and the citizen science group, so the NGO was the Bucket Brigade and uh, Public Lab, decided that they were going to try this out. So they started putting weather balloons up in the air with these cameras on them that were doing continuous shots. And then they were stitching those things together to make maps. And those maps eventually got used to prove that BP had liability 
uh, to, to pay people that oil had hit their coastline when they were claiming that it never did. So that's the kind of thing that, you know, it's very simple. We, we believe in low cost. We believe in accessible. We believe in thinking about the community. And we also want to, to show evidence. We believe in that scientific method. And so we're also, and it's important to say with these things, is that we're kind of tool agnostic. We will, we, and that's what makes us a little different than a lot of the other handbooks and tutorials that are out there, is that we want to say, you know, how could you know, Frontline SMS be used for your project as an environmental journalist in a developing country, which is something that's not typically answered in a, a manual. It's that contextualization. It's that extra layer of audience that allows this uptake of information to happen, these new skills to really make sense for people. Because I think that's often a given sometimes, is that, well, th this is just going to make sense because it works here, so why wouldn't it work there? So we're really trying to think through those things and discover why people should do this and help explain that. So that's pretty much it for today. Um, we have a lot of ads and websites. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'll also be outside exhibiting if I'm not in a panel, which has been kind of hard, not speaking on a panel, but listening to other speakers, which has been really fun. But um, I'll try and find some time to be outside with a big screen so that you can play with a lot of these tools, because a PowerPoint doesn't really cut it. Um, but if you want to explore for yourself, you know, here's all of the sites and the bats and the everything. Oh, thanks. <laughs>